Welcome. I'm Carl Frederick, and I will be interviewing individuals for Kenosha Voices, an oral history project of the Kenosha County Historical Society in conjunction with Kenosha Community Media. I have worked in newspapers for more than 40 years as an editor and a reporter. 38 and a half of those years were at the Kenosha News. I am also a member of the Kenosha County Historical Society Board. We hope you enjoy these programs. I'm talking to John Drew, a former AMC employee and union official with the Local uh, 72. Hello, John, how are you doing? Hi, Carl, happy to be here. Good, when did you start working at AMC and how did you come to be employed? What was that process like? Well, it's a date that I will never forget, uh, May 2nd, 1974. And one, just one thing about the, your starting date um, was a hugely important date uh, to always uh, keep in mind because uh, that set your seniority. And your seniority in the plant um, could mean uh, everything in terms of the difference between working and being laid off. Uh, it uh, meant your ability to bid on a, a better job or get to a different department. Um, so, so yeah, so May 2nd, 74, and I think if you talk to anybody that worked at the plant, uh, they're gonna be able to tell you their seniority date um, just like that. Um, so how did I come to American Motors? Um, well, I, I grew up in Waukegan uh, and I was, I was living there at the time, uh, 21 years old. And uh, I saw an ad in the Waukegan paper. Um, uh, AMC was hiring production workers. Uh, I was working in a, a, a small factory in Waukegan at the time. And a friend of mine uh, saw it and wanted to go up and apply and he didn't have a car and he asked me for a ride. And I was interested um, and um, I said, sure, I'll give you a ride. And while I was there, I filled out an application. And uh, uh, several weeks later, um, I got a call and uh, I went in for an interview. Uh, the interview, and you have to realize that was a time when um, American Motors was hiring uh, hundreds of people um, just to keep the assembly lines staffed. Um, and the interview consisted really of a very, really one question, as I recall. Um, <clears throat> the interviewee uh, was a guy named John Brown, who um, was a longtime uh, AMC uh, salaried employee in the employment office. And he looked at my application and I had noted my education that I had one year at the University of Illinois. I had, um, I had dropped out. And uh, he looked at that and he said, well, when are you going back to college? And I said, well, I don't really, I don't have any plans uh, to go back. He said, okay, you'll start tomorrow. Um, that was the extent of the interview. And I think that gives you an indication of uh, uh, just how the, uh, the need for workers at that time at American Motors was so great um, that um, pretty much, pretty much if you were, uh, if you showed up and you had a pulse, um, you had a, stood a good chance of getting hired. Okay, so what departments did you work in and what was a typical day like on the job? Well, I started out, I was uh, fortunate. Um, I started out in material handling, um, which was a, uh, it, it was a, desirable place to work, higher seniority department, and I did not last very long there. Um, I had a variety of jobs in material handling, but within less than a year, I was bumped onto the uh, final assembly line. And um, a little bit about my first job on the final assembly line, um, I, was, uh, I was in the pit, and um, you have to kind of picture it, but um, there were narrow pits that went underneath the assembly line that you had <clears throat> had to climb down to get into um, to work on the to work on the bottom of the car and it was all overhead work. So I get put on a job and there's a 
coworker is breaking me in. And, um, you know, we used to, we used to talk about a break in period of three days. If you, you know, you basically had three days to learn a job. So I'm working on this job and I was securing brake lines, uh, uh, constantly working overhead and doing a couple of other things. And, um, after two days, um, and I, I was felt like I was at about the limit of my physical capabilities. Uh, and after two days, the guy that was breaking me in said, yeah, you're doing pretty good. Um, tomorrow, I'll show you the other half of the job. So, um, and, and I think my story is not at all uncommon. Uh, the work on the assembly line could be it, it was fast paced, um, it was uh, repetitive, uh, it was often awkward. Um, uh, it, so to, to feel like I can't do this, I can't do this, then all of a sudden you realize, yeah, I guess I can do this. And you know, after three, three days, um, you started to, to get the hang of it, um, usually. Um, but uh, it was, it was tough work. It wasn't for everybody. Uh, it wasn't uncommon in those days for workers to leave at lunchtime. And I, I worked on the second shift, um, leave at lunchtime and um, not only not come back for the rest of their shift, but never come back um, just because they decided that uh, that kind of work just wasn't for them. Okay. What kind of safety equipment uh, was required and how did you go about using it and had it changed over the time that you'd been there? Well, you know, safety equipment, um, I spent a lot of time working in the metal shop, um, which was where the bodies were basically uh, uh, put together, welded together. Um, safety equipment would be safety glasses, um, maybe earplugs. I don't even know if we wore earplugs in those early days. Uh, and you'd get maybe sleeves to, um, to put over your welding jacket uh, while you were working to protect you. Um, and you know, the metal shop was a, um, a, another place that could be a very difficult place to work. And I remember my first day in the metal shop, um, it was at the main plant and um, I got put on a job um, spot welding around the um, windshield. And um, again, coworker breaking me in in the morning and it was hot. It was the middle of July um, in 1978 and uh, probably 95 degrees outside. It was hot. Um, uh, of course, you know, no air conditioning or, or anything like that in the plant. And shift started at seven o'clock and I'm working with this guy and at 9 30 he tells me hey um I'm a union steward I just got called uh off the job I have to leave so there I was stuck for the rest of the day uh <clears throat> by myself on an unfamiliar job uh and somehow you know you figure out a way to get through it um but uh it was uh it, it was a uh in some ways, the, the production process was um, dependent on people doing what they had to, what, what they could do with the tools and the equipment that they were given and the training, which was usually not real extensive. Okay. When did you get involved with Local 72? Well, I got involved in the union. Um, my first involvement with the union was... Um, uh, there was a, a group of us, um, uh, and um, really the, the, the most important people in that group were myself, uh, Todd Onstead, and John Melrod. We started a newsletter um, called The Fighting Times, um, and we were basically a, a caucus within the union, and uh, we were not officials in the union, but we were rank and file activists. And we started a newsletter called The Fighting Times, <clears throat> which basically we use that newsletter to um, kind of give a voice to people in the plant and to talk about 
issues that people were facing daily. And a lot of that revolved around, um, you know, difficulties with jobs, um, safety concerns, um, racial discrimination, uh, sexual harassment, uh, things that supervisors were doing and management were doing that were um, uh, hard on the people on the assembly lines. So that was my first involvement was the newsletter. And there was, the, there was a whole history to that newsletter. Um, we eventually got sued by American Motors. Um, they filed a lawsuit. Actually, it was six supervisors um, filed a lawsuit against us for um, slander, uh, libel, and uh, intentional infliction of emotional distress because um, uh, we were hitting home with our articles. And we had a jury trial in Racine, uh, a, a two-week jury trial, and we ultimately ended up um, coming out of that with uh, zero damages uh, that were owed to any of the plaintiffs. And in fact, through the course of the trial, I think the, the, the plaintiffs ended up looking worse than we had even painted them in some of our articles. But that was, that was the first involvement. And then uh, also, you have to understand Local 72 had a very extensive uh, system of union representatives in the plant. And uh, I was first elected to be a union steward, a group steward uh, in the metal shop. And that was in 1979. Um, and uh, I continued as a steward or an assistant chief steward for several years. And then uh, <clears throat> 1984, I was elected to the executive board of Local 72, which was a, a full-time position um, representing an area of the plant um, that was assigned to you by the, by the president. Okay, uh, could you describe the relationship between uh, Local 72 and uh, management? Well, I think if, if, you, if you go back to the years when I started, um, it, was a, it was a very adversarial relationship for the most part. Um, and I think it really, it had its roots in how the union was formed. Um, you know, uh, the, the forerunner to Local 72 was called, uh, it was a, a federal labor union. It was before the UAW itself was even organized in 1933. And the union started with a sit-down strike. Um, and um, <clears throat> there was a famous meeting between the newly elected bargaining committee and Charles Nash. And uh, he... Uh, dangled the keys to the plant in front of the committee and he said, I'll lock the doors and throw these keys in Lake Michigan before I'll recognize the union. Um, after a few days on strike that changed and the union was recognized. But I think the relationship between the company and the union, I think sort of carried over. Um, there was a, a very arm's length relationship. The union uh, had a lot of power. Um, had a lot of shop floor presence in terms of the, the stewards um, and the involvement of the membership. Um, so it was a it was a it was a a, a tough relationship. Uh, I think the company knew the power that the union had, and the union knew the power that um, the company had. So there was a. Uh, uh, in a way, it was mutually assured destruction, I guess, um, that both sides knew the power that they held. I mean, company held the power to basically, uh, you know, all their production was in Kenosha. Um, all the, the bulk of the production was in Kenosha, and they, the union had power to um, affect that. Um, over the years, that changed, you know, there was the, with the the globalization of the auto industry really hit Kenosha, uh, and that happened um, later um, in the 80s. It happened with the American Motors getting bought by Chrysler and the um, closing of the assembly plant. And then in later years, when, <clears throat> when I was the president of the union, and really Rudy Kuzel, who was um, the president um, from 1984 until 1986, I think Rudy um, really set a tone for um, how the 
how we dealt with the company. And in, in early years, Rudy was the really the leader of a very militant union. And in, in later years, um, Rudy led us into uh, working with the company uh, to uh, do everything we could to keep the engine plant running after the assembly plant closed. Okay, do you have any interesting stories uh, from your time, either as a uh, union representative or uh, as a worker on the line? Well, there's probably a story for every day that we went to went into the plant. But uh, w one thing I wanted to, to mention, um, you know, there was a, I think you've all, everybody's probably heard or seen of the stories of the workers at lunchtime running across 52nd Street um, to go to the bars and uh, have a beer. Uh, and that was a big, you know, that was a thing, you know, at uh, traffic would stop in Kenosha uh, at uh, lunchtime <clears throat> when workers were running across the street to the bars and people would have their drinks set up on the bar when they got there. And, you know, so there was a, there was a sort of a perception of a culture of, drinking in the plant. And as union officials, um, you know, in the early days, I guess we used to think our job was to make sure people didn't get in trouble if they were caught drinking or something like that. And um, Rudy Kuzel, um, was who, who was became the president and earlier was on the executive board and was, he was the first what we call alcohol and drug rep. Um, for the local. And Rudy really was a visionary in terms of how the union should deal with issues of alcohol and drug abuse. And um, we had a very, very set up procedure that if someone was under the influence um, or if they exhibited symptoms of being under the influence, they would be sent out for a test. Uh, if they um, uh, their blood alcohol content was above the legal limit for driving. I think it was, you know, 0 0.10 and then later 0 0.08. Then they were faced with a choice that they could take a 30 day time off penalty, or they could go into a um, structured program um, to um, that consisted of a lot of outpatient uh, uh, visits and also AA meetings. And if it happened a second time, um, they were discharged uh, and had the same opportunities. And I think we had a just a, a really strong program. And um, you know, under Rudy's leadership, I think um, a lot of a lot of people's lives were made better and changed. And a lot of people didn't make it. And usually, those people ended up um, getting fired. Uh, and a lot of those people um, ended up um, dying very young, um, people who didn't make it through the program. So, so that was, a, that was a, a, a good example, I think, of you know, the role, one of the roles that the union played. Um, and, and I will say something else that I'm, I'm real proud of that the, the union did um, is in 1980, we were the first local, and I was not on the committee. There were other, uh, on the bargaining committee at that time, there were other, um, um, visionary people on the bargaining committee that negotiated the first Martin Luther King holiday uh, within the UAW, within the auto industry. And that was before Martin Luther King's birthday was a national holiday. Um, and I, I think it was very significant because we had a black um, population in the plant um, that was probably 15 to 20%. Um, and uh, it was a recognition of what the UAW stood for. And, you know, every year from 1981 on, uh, we held a Martin Luther King uh, commemorative program at Local 72, which drew huge crowds. Uh, we brought in national civil rights uh, figures to speak, um, uh, Jesse Jackson, Reverend Joseph Lowry, uh, and, and many others came over the years. And I, I think that was one of the, really, I think one of the things that set Local 72 apart um, was that um, we took a strong stand against discrimination 
uh, and uh, I guess you could say we were, we didn't know it then, but I guess we were early proponents of Black Lives Matters um, ba back in those days. Okay, uh, were there a lot of cliques within the uh, plant or some people, did they socialize afterward? How did that come about? What was that like? Well, I, 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 a couple of things. One, people were very social in the plant. Um, so when you had, you know, holidays, um, special occasions, people in work areas would get together and bring in food and, um, you know, make it into a social event uh, at lunchtime in the plant. Um, and, and I will say one of the great things about um, AMC and Local 72 was there was a high percentage of women in our workforce. And that just made a much more civil and I think social workplace. Um, you know, I, <clears throat> after I left Local 72, I represented a lot of different plants as a, as a UAW rep and a lot of them were, you know, pretty much entirely male plants. And you never, you, you, you really never got the same sense of kind of a sort of the social cohesion and also just um, in terms of um, women being on the same jobs, getting paid the same as men. Uh, it, it was, you know, really a, a sort of a, 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 a leveling thing that, um, uh, made for a very good atmosphere in the plant. So there was a, so there was the social aspect in the plant. People, you know, if some, something happened, people would take up a collection for people if they had a need, um, you know, people that worked in that same area. And then outside of that, Local 72 really was a, a social center for people. Um, we had, um, you know, we had dances um, that once a month at Local 72. Um, we had various activities, bowling leagues, golf leagues, uh, softball tournaments, um, just uh, many, many ways that people could um, interact and get involved. We had a, a community services committee that did things uh, in the community. Um, we you know, made donations to charitable causes. Um, things like that. So it really was a center, uh, a social center for people um, outside of work. Hey, did the uh, company ever sponsor any activities? Well, there was a, there was something called the Kanasha Club, um, which, uh, you, you know, it's a, a, a little tricky play on words there, Kanasha Club. Um, yeah. But the Kanasha Club was a company, you know, it was a employee company, um, club and Kanasha Club had activities, um, uh, bus trips to ball games, um, things like that. Um, but you know, to me, uh, I was always much more <clears throat> comfortable uh, doing things through the union. Okay, you mentioned globalization of the auto industry as as a factor of change. Were there any other factors that affected? Um, the company as it moved forward in uh, through the 70s into the 80s, the closure and then the engine plant, what factors led to all that? <laughs> well, you know, when I started in the plant, um, there were 10,000 members in Local 72. Um, the UAW controlled the auto market. So, you know, 95% of the cars that were sold in this country were built by UAW members. And over time, that changed dramatically. Okay, I think right now it's less than 50% of the cars that are sold in this country are built by UAW members. So, you know, globalization, when I say that, I mean, there, there's a couple aspects to that. I mean, one was the imported cars coming in, which started to affect American Motors in the, uh, in the late set, really in the 80s, it started to affect American Motors. And then there was the companies that set up plants in this country, foreign companies that had set up plants in this country, non-union plants. Um, and then after NAFTA, there was all the work that, that went to Mexico. So 
it had a huge impact on Kenosha um, uh, and, and on American Motors and, you know, forced American Motors to uh, look for partnerships, um, you know, first with Renault, um, then with Chrysler, and then, of course, Chrysler with Daimler, and then later with Fiat. And, you know, I, I, I think the flags that f flew over the plant over the years um, changed. Um, you know, we worked for French company, we worked for a German company, we worked for an Italian company. They all changed. The only constant really was the UAW flag uh, that, that flew over the plant for all those years. So had a tremendous impact and, um, you know, it became um, a com competitive issue as there were uh, more foreign cars coming in, foreign plants in this country. And there really wasn't any um, government, coherent government policy to protect um, uh, the American manufacturing base and the U.S. auto industry. Um, so yeah, so we suffered because of that. And ultimately we lost the plant. When did you retire? Well, I left the plant in 2004. Um, so I, I put in um, a little, little more than 30 years at the plant. Um, and then I went to work for the, <clears throat> the regional office of the UAW. And I worked for that uh, region four UAW until 2018. So I've been retired for almost four years now. Okay, what was your feeling when the uh, company closed? Now, I don't know which one would have been more significant, the engine plant or the assembly. Uh, well, going back to the assembly plant closing, uh, I mean, that was, that was just devastating. Um, it, it, to, to sort of see the last cars go down the line, uh, of those mm -hmm. final days in December of 1988, uh, just you know, kind of an, an indescribable feeling for, uh, for the people that work there um, to basically see their entire future um, yanked out from under them. Um, and there was about f over 5,000, I think it was 5,500 people lost their jobs when the assembly plant closed. Um, and, you know, what that did to families, what that did to the community, um, uh, it just the, the, the negative consequences of that rippling through, you know, people went and, you know, they did what they had to do. People um, found jobs. Uh, <clears throat> we had about a, close to a thousand people move to other Chrysler plants um, throughout the country. Um, but it just, it, 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 was, it was sort of like we had a good thing going and it just, ended. Um, so that, that was, that was t very difficult. I mean, Local 72 put up a, a battle against that plant closing. Um, you know, um, we personalized that uh, against Lee Iacocca because he was the, you know, the face of the company and he had made representations and promises uh, to Kenosha that were broken uh, when the assembly plant closed. Um, so, so it was devastating. Um, and when the engine plant closed, I mean, uh, that was in 2010. I was, was not at the plant then. I was working for the UAW and one of my responsibilities was to um, help the local. And uh, that closing was, you know, I mean, the, the finality of that was, um, you know, just, just very, very difficult and very wrong what happened. Um, you know, Kenosha had been um, you know, we had done a fantastic job under Chrysler. Chrysler had invested almost a billion dollars in Kenosha um, after the assembly plant closed and upgrading the engine plant. Our quality and uh, productivity numbers were were great. We had a we had a great experienced workforce. Um, so that was again um, something beyond beyond our control and really to me comes down to 
uh, policies that really just were non-existent in terms of protecting um, jobs, manufacturing jobs. And I think we're, we're seeing the effect of that in, in many different ways um, in the country now. You and you know, the American, if you, if you, you go back and you think about the American Motors setup, um, it was pretty unique. Um, you know, the lakefront plant was a former mattress factory um, uh, that was, you know, multiple buildings on multiple floors uh, on the lakefront. Um, and, bod you know, bodies were trucked across town to the final assembly uh, for the final assembly line. So it was a, you know, it, it was a unique place. Um, it was, uh, uh, you know, a, a place that provided a great living for a lot of people. Um, a great place to work, uh, you know, notwithstanding all of the, the problems there were, but it was a great place to work. I was, I was very fortunate um, to kind of, you know, I was 21 years old when I went to work there. I just think I was very fortunate to grow up in that environment with, uh, with a, a great union, with great traditions, uh, people coming together, making, making a good living, uh, working together, building a great product. Um, you know, and, and one, of the, one of the great things about working uh, at American Motors and Chrysler to me was <clears throat> the chance to work with people uh, from all kinds of different backgrounds, um, uh, all doing the same work, getting the same pay for the, for the same kind of work. Um, so you got to know people as people. Um, you know, I don't think a lot of people in, I think too few people in this country, um, for example, get to work side by side with um, white and black, Hispanic together, um, doing the same thing, learning that, you know, we don't, we got way more in common than we have uh, uh, different. And um, I just think it's a, it, it's a, uh, one, of, one of the most fortunate things in my life, I think, was to come into that atmosphere and um, you know, spend those, spend those years at the plant. Okay. Do you miss the company? Oh God. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, I mean, I, I miss, you know, I mean, I think everybody that retired, everybody that ever retired out of the plant said, you know, I miss the people, um, perhaps not the work, um, but miss the people, but, but also just miss the fact that it's gone, um, from Kenosha and that, uh, you know, over a hundred years of uh, auto making tradition uh, is is no longer, and um, yeah, that's a that's a that's a difficult thing to come to grips with. I don't like to even uh, drive down um, 30th Avenue, um, go past the the site of the plant. Um, it's just uh, it's it's tough, and 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 you know, and and I. It, it worked, things worked out great for me, much better than they did, I think, for a, a lot of uh, people that worked there in terms of, you know, I was able to go work for the UAW afterwards and I didn't have to relocate to another plant. Um, you know, I mean, you know, I had layoffs, but layoffs were, to me, were in the early years when I worked there. I was young, um, you know, and um, was able to, to survive um, those layoffs. So, yeah, so I think, you know, for, for a lot of people, um, you know, not, not only was it the end of an era, but also you don't have those opportunities now um, for young people um, to go into a place like American Motors and, um, you know, get a foothold and be able to, um, you know, have a family supporting job. Did robotics play a part in lessening employment levels? Well, yeah. I mean, if you kind of, even if you look at the engine plant, um, the older <clears throat> engines that we built, the holdover AMC engines, were very labor intensive uh, in terms of just the, the, the numbers of people that were needed, uh, uh, particularly in the assembly process, but also um, you know, handling parts and things like that. And in later years in the engine plant, uh, as the 
big investments came in, uh, there was much more of a reliance on um, uh, automated processes, um, you know, much less reliance on, on uh, individuals kind of working shoulder to shoulder on, on the line. So yeah, so big, big impact uh, on employment. Um, you know, so the, the jobs changed a lot. Um, but um, I think that the, the biggest impact was really, you know, just the, the, the globalization. I mean, you can, li you can live with, you can live with um, improvements in the process that are going to take less people as long as you still have jobs. Uh, you touched on what I think you saw as the best part of working at the company and the people and the experience of different people working together. You can add to that if you'd like, if you finished with that, what was the worst part of the job? Well, I mean, I think not so much for me because I, I was fortunate. I was never injured on a job, okay? But I think that was one of the worst parts of the job was the injuries um, that people sustained, be they, you know, in particular the repetitive motion injuries. Um, we had a very difficult situation uh, in the, um, would have been in the 90s uh, in the engine plant um, with um, respiratory problems um, where, um, uh, scores of people um, got very sick with a, uh, a, a respiratory disease from the uh, coolants that were used in the machining process. Um, so I think those were some of the worst things to me was the, the people who got hurt or the people who got sick. Uh, we, it was uh, something called HP hypersensitivity pneumonitis, but the people that got sick and never were able to really re gain full functions. Now, we were able to, you know, and the union was able to get the company and force the company to improve that and, uh, you know, uh, make great improvements in the ventilation system in the plant. So we, we eventually overcame that and changing some of the, the coolants that were used, we overcame that. But that was some of the worst things besides the, you know, the, the, the loss of jobs and the plant closings, which is, you know, absolutely the worst. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, injuries, illnesses and loss of jobs, like, yeah, it's sort of like it is, you know, and I, and I remember some of the doctors um, that we had working on the people who had the respiratory, they said, you know, people wanted to come back to work and the doctor said, it's just not worth it for you to go back and set foot inside that plant um, because they had been so sensitized to the environmental hazards in the plant. Is there anything else you'd like to share about your time, either in the union or in the plant? Um, well, I think that, um, you know, the, the history of Local 72 was intertwined um, with the, the history of American Motors. And um, I think that, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great, it was a great era um, in Kenosha, um, not only for the, the pride that people took in the products that they built, um, not only the standard of living that it provided to people so that they could, um, you know, buy homes and send their kids to college. Um, uh, but also the, um, the collective nature of the union and people uh, banding together in the union and um, the union uh, through collective bargaining, um, through involvement of the membership, uh, providing um, the, the benefits, the backing and um, just sort of the, um, you know, the, the democratic nature of our organization. Uh, it, was, it was a great era uh, um, for, for Kenosha, for UAW, and for American Motors and Chrysler. Okay. Thank you, John. All right. Thank you. And uh, go Kenosha History Center. I love what you guys are doing. <laughs> thank you.